Hello and welcome everybody to the China's Changing Energy Climate webinar. My name is Sarah Hastings Simon. I'm Director of Feminist Clean Economy Program in Alberta. I'm thrilled to be hosting this webinar today. We're joined today by two China energy and climate experts, Dr. Jin Ling and Ren Ping Song. Dr. Lin is the Nat Simons Chair in China Energy Policy and a staff scientist with Berkeley Labs China Energy Group. His research is focused on energy and climate policy issues in China, and he's a co-leader of the Berkeley Tsinghua Joint Research Center on Energy and Climate Change, a collaborative program between Berkeley Lab, the University of California, Berkeley, and Tsinghua University in China. Ran Ping Song is a developing country climate action manager for World Resources Institute, where he serves as a global focus point across WRI for work on developing country actions. Previously, from 2012 to 2015, Ren Ping served as the team lead for the China Climate Program, where he led the development and implementation of climate strategy in China. Canada and the world is watching China very closely. With the Trump administration in the U.S. taking steps backwards on climate action, China is signaling an intention to lead with the potential for significant impacts on both global carbon emissions and energy demand, as well as demand for Canada's energy exports. This year, Canada announced it would create and co-host, together with China and the EU, a new multilateral forum, the Ministerial on Climate Action. 34 governments of major economies participated in the first meeting held in Montreal in September of this year. And just yesterday, Canada released a joint statement on climate change and clean growth with China, underscoring their mutual commitment to moving forward with a Paris Agreement agenda and increasingly technology transfers between both countries. Our speakers will each share their insights on key trends in China's energy market and their implications for Canada and the world. And then we'll have uh, plenty of time for a Q&A section following their remarks. Um, if folks are tweeting, please use the hashtag ClimateChina. And without further delay, I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Lin, who will begin. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. And, and thank you for the opportunity to participate uh, in this webinar. Uh, I First of all, I just offer uh, a few observations about the growing trend in energy and climate change in China. Uh, as you may know that China has experienced very fast economic growth over the last 40 years, um, which has led to very fast growth in energy and coal use in China. Uh, given that coal is about two thirds of China's energy supply, the emission of CO2 as well as conventional air pollution has increased rapidly in the last few de decades as well. Air pollution became a serious social as well as environmental challenge in the early 2010s. However, the resulting air pollution crisis, as well as the changing structure in Chinese economy, has also triggered a new thinking and new actions in China on energy and climate front. Uh, it may not be well known in Canada that China is the largest solar and wind investor in the world, as well as the leading manufacturer of solar PVs, wind turbines, and electric vehicles. In 2016, almost half of the new addition in global PV are installed in China, as well as about 40% of the wind turbines. So this action is not only motivated by concern over air pollution in China, but also by the recognition that clean energy technology are strategic investment in future economic development by Chinese decision makers in government, as well as in industry. China is also a leader in global climate change arena. China's commitment to peak its emission um, by 2030 as part of a joint climate announcement with the U.S. was a key contributing factor to the successful conclusion of the Paris Agreement. And despite the changes in the U.S. position, China has made it clear it will uphold its own commitment under the Paris Agreement and is working with many national partners to build a global alliance for climate protection. I think Sarah just mentioned that this newest joint announcement in Canada is, is another evidence China is keeping its uh, leadership position on climate change. 
So I'll share this opening remark, be happy to entertain any question you may have. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Um, I think we'll, uh, we'll have people hold their questions, but please do uh, start to type them in. I see some of you have found the, um, the box to, to type the questions into the GoToWebinar panel, so please type your questions there. Um, but first, we'll um, hear from Ren Ping. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, can you, uh, can you all see the screen? Yes. Just to confirm yeah. that you can see the screen. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to have the opportunity to speak today. So, um, it's actually a pretty interesting uh, topic. Um, you know, the, in the screen here, you actually see the largest floating solar farm in the world. Um, it's actually about 100 square, square mile big. Uh, it, it, can, it has energy to power about 15,000 homes. Um, you know, interestingly, it, it's located in, in Anhui, in the province in China, which is uh, really cold rich. And fittingly, uh, this specific largest, you know, the world's largest solar, floating solar farms is uh, built on top of a, a lake that was, uh, that was, you know, uh, that was once uh, intense mining zoo that, you know, when the, when the mining stops and um, there's heavy rain and they create this lake and the China decided to build a, you know, the world's largest floating solar panel, uh, solar farm there. So to me, this has symbolized the period, the big period that Dr. Lin just talked about. Um, you know, it happened. You know, it, it, to, it told the story of what happened in China in the past few years. Uh, you know, the, the effort China is trying to steer its economy from an energy and emission intensive one to a low carbon one, but it also hints on China's coal legacy and its challenge to come. Um, you know, just to provide a little bit more context about you know China's. Uh, tremendous, you know, change in the past few years. That from 2020, when China's coal consumption is just a little bit more than 1.3 billion tons uh, per year, and in 2013, that number saw all the way to 4.24 billion tons, uh, with an annual growth rate of about 12% per year. Um, in 2015, China actually accounted for about 50% of global coal consumption. A country alone account for 50% of global consumption. And then you hear that uh, Dr. Lin talk about the, the big change that China take place that was mainly fueled by the economy change as well as the desire to protect the environment and you know to improve health of people. So in 2014, um, the coal consumption actually started to fall. Uh, that continued in 2016 and uh, 15 and 16. Uh, so for, for three years in a row, that China's coal consumption and associated greenhouse gas emissions appeared to level off. That was the story that we all talk about. Uh, that was the big change in the efforts China had put in um, and received very concrete outcomes. But the latest result coming from the Global Carbon Project and the University of X in Angelica that made an unfortunate projection uh, earlier this year, actually a few weeks ago, that um, Global projection emission is uh, projected to go up again uh, with 3% emission, go from 3.5% from China. That was mainly fueled by a 3% surge of coal consumption in China uh, with additional you know, coal uh, uh, consumption from oil and natural gas. Um, you know, oil and natural gas estimates are consistent with the decade long trend, but coal as consumption actually was a little bit you know, different from the, from the past few years. So that best the Question: Is it the latest data? Is it just a temporary blip, or a more longer-term running trend? Um, the silver lining for all the all this is that you know, despite the growth in 2017, uh, it's a, a, the coal consumption is unlikely to reach its all-time high in 2013. Despite the growth, actually China's coal consumption actually dropped by 8 percent compared to 2013, and you know China's Renewable energy continue to grow. In you know, in July this year, China's solar PV capacity topped about more than 100 gigawatts, uh, exceeding the country's target by 2020. Um, you know, the government was its response is wants to to put in an even more ambitious installation target, and you know, and and as a result, projection is to grow by 20 more than 200 gigawatts. Um, uh, you know, in 2020. 
what's that? What's that? It's, 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 it's amount to five times larger than the current renewable energy capacity of the United States uh, in just two years or three years. So to answer the question of whether this is a this is a beep or an ongoing trend, I think the answer is you know lay on two factors, driving forces that uh, explain why China uh, you know, coal consumption and greenhouse gas emissions level off in the past few years, and that also determined whether this is a this is a beep or longer term. The one um, factor that I think Dr. Lin also also mentioned is that the you know the new structure of the Chinese economy, the so-called quote unquote new normal economy. Um, you know, under the so-called new com new normal economy, that the economic growth has decreased significantly, and especially for energy intensive manufacturing and constructor industry uh, has slowed. In the past, in the past, you know, for example, between 2000, uh, 1991 to 2010, uh, there these two sectors that they go at an average rate about six, uh, 12 or 13 percent on average. And in last year, uh, you know, in during the year that was let level off, those growth stopped or, or zero or actually uh, sometimes actually uh, you know stop to grow. In the first three quarters, as we see, there's a temperature, uh, there's a there's a emission increase. Um, you know, we also saw some increase of you know energy uh, activities in these sectors in cement, or in cement is mostly frac, but in steel, uh, electricity production and chemical productions. And these sectors actually account for the vast majority of coal consumption in China. But those growth are moderate in comparison of the history of performance benchmark. Um, the the electricity consumption, uh, electricity production uh, go around sixty. 6.9% and cool steel production go about 6.3% and chemical manufacturing go 3.8% which is way lower than uh, in the past although that you know that's still contribute to why the emission has uh, continued to increase again the second driving force that China you know the push China onto this new track is is the strengthening of climate and, uh, climate and air pollution policies you know policy efforts that has accelerated the decline of coal in China's energy mix um, you know, China has put in place, you know, deep, uh, you know, very stringent binding targets on air pollution and concentration and energy intensity since 2006 and six, and then, you know, as a result, coal consumption has reduced. So whether this uh, new vision that China is trying to achieve as a low carbon economy will take hold, I think there's actually three uh, ways to 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 take a you know projection on that. One is, you know, whether China will actually be uh, successful to Further cut its industrial energy consumption. Um, you know, the, oh, just four sectors: cement, electricity production, uh, steel, and um, um, steel and, and chemical production. Actually, already account for vast majority of coal consumption. And then, industrial energy consumption is the major source of energy uh, consumption in China. So, whether China has been, will be successful to cut the industrial energy consumption uh, would be a key factor. Um, early this year. Uh, Prime Minister of Li Keqiang in China announced their uh, China's plan to cut 50 million ton of uh, production capacity in, in steel and 150 million ton of production capacity in coal. Um, that is production capacity. That does not necessarily reflect on the uh, production per se, but that is a very clear signal the government is sending. Um, another indicator is China's 35-year uh, plan, which ends by 2020. Uh, project, you know, as mandated energy intensity reduced compared to 2015 to reduce 15%. In 2016, a year alone, uh, China has reduced 5%. Um, you know, in the first three, three quarters of this year, that is another 3.8% reduction. You know, that means China's already halfway through its energy reduction target. So whether China's been able to uh, keep on this trend will determine uh, a big chunk of their China's emission future. Another part is renewables. Um, you know, as that China, is, as Dr. Lin pointed out, China is already a heavy weight in the renewable energy market, uh, in renewable investment and manufacturing utilization. But that doesn't mean that the renewable have no challenge in in the world. Uh, in China, you know, particularly on curtailment means that you know potential uh, energy that was wasted, although that it could be utilized uh, because of grid issues or because that uh, you know they have to you know there's other priorities that, that the grid is giving to the coal power plants. Um, another issue is uh, the payment agreements that you know renewable energy is receiving uh, some delay of reimbursement of fee tariffs that was promised to them. 
um, you know, there's very underlying uh, reasons, for example, that uh, there's a vast majority of already built coal power plants already sitting there, and the utilization rate is very, is very low. They're putting a lot of pressure for the grid to give them, you know, more allowance or quota, per se, to generate electricity rather than give it to the renewable energy. Um, you know, another piece for the for the for Riemann is that because the the free and tariff essentially are subsidies for the renewable energy was based on a percentage on the you know price that was leveled on the um, against the price electricity of, of the price right and for if renewable energy has been so successful in China and as a result that it outpays the, the you know the average growth rate for electricity in China by a lot and therefore by definition that the need to finance the, the, the tariff uh, has outpaced the, 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 the growth of revenue. That was the by definition of the, the equation. So that back to China, that back China has to employ more innovative and pragmatic policy approaches to make sure that this new vision take hold. Uh, by pragmatic, that I mean that you know what China has been uh, testing in the past that actually work. Um, you know, for example, the traditional command and control approach, where the government is, uh, for example, the energy saving target is disaggregation mechanism. Essentially, the uh, higher level government, you know, disaggregate its target to a lower lower level government, and then you know, even to the uh, individual enterprises, and then have a regulation that hey, you have to meet the saving energy saving target. There's also financial rewarding mechanisms, as well as information guidance. You know, come come along or away with this kind of this, um, mechanisms. And it proved to be work on a, you know, largely it's, it's been proven to be working. And, you know, to what extent China is going to expand that, you know, to total energy consumption, even to other arena, uh, scope of work, you know, such as, you know, curb, curbing the non-CO2 emissions, or non-CO2 greenhouse gases using these mechanisms. You know, that would be one more pragmatic or trad traditionally try and useful approach. But also, you soon that low handling food already been picked, that, you know, China also need to apply more uh, innovative approach, like a market-oriented approach, uh, you know, another way to finance the renewable energy p uh, policies. I'm not going to go into detail here, but if interesting, we can discuss more detail about what the potential more innovative policy approach are out there. Um, the China does have a lot of options, um, you know, to what choose, to what kind of choices to make would actually determine a lot on what the end results. Um, you know, I want to just conclude to, to say that, you know, although that China has been um, come through a lot and we, we are actually very confident China will, will, will overachieve its Paris Agreement uh, target, uh, but that will not be enough. You know, uh, research shows that for the world to have a, you know, decent chance to meet the two degree, you know, goal and then in a cost effective manner that the world have to pick its emission by 2020. Um, that means that stronger action is not optional, and China in the past has proven that when you know it put its mind on a very focus and want to reduce emission and associate uh, you know energy consumption, that it can do it. So um, so that will be my conclusion. So that I we, I believe China can do more, and it has to be do more. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much to both of our panelists. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. I see we already have quite a few great questions coming in uh, through the um, webinar control panel, so please add, add your questions there. Um, I'll kick us off with a, with a coal-focused one. So I think, uh, Ren Ping, I heard you say that coal consumption has dropped 8% uh, compared with China's peak uh, in 2013. You mentioned the change in the economy and regulations that were driving that. I'm wondering if, if you uh, or Dr. Lin can speak to, you know, we also hear a lot about how China is building coal plants. Um, so how do we uh, how do we make sense of those two two stats that seem at odds with each other of the drop in coal uh, from its peak in the construction of coal plants? So let me talk about two things. One is the overall coal use trend in China, and one is coal power plant. Uh, the second one actually is easier to talk about. You know, people used to hear this number kind of builds one giant coal plant a week, right? That has changed totally. Uh, in the last few years, 75% of the new power plant built in China are so-called non-fossil renewable types, you know, solar, wind, hydro, nuclear. So coal plant as a percentage in the overall new construction has, has um, become much smaller share. Uh, second, 
Chinese government just recently issued in this late summer a uh, new regulation to stop uh, or postpone the construction of roughly 150 gigawatts of coal plant. So people recognize um, there's potentially too much or too many baseline coal plant in China, right? There's a very well recognized phenomena um, by government and industry leaders and people are trying to, to address that over capacity issue through a variety of um, government directive and market measures. Uh, and for example, in China is looking um, to design wholesale power market um, in different provinces in China. That was certainly sent a very strong signal that uh, there's less demand for a typical coal plant in the future. On the overall coal trend, uh, the situation is more nuanced. Our research shows that China may have entered a period of plateauing in terms of coal use. So it means the coal use will sort of a uh, being flat or modulating at a level for, for the next few years before showing um, a decline. So that that's partly, you know, um, determined by economic growth. If you have a faster economic growth, there's faster demand, I mean, higher demand for energy resources, given coal is two third energy supply, they've driven that. Uh, in terms of um, electricity demand, our research also shows that, you know, there's tremendous amount of a building of solar and wind um, power plants. But as long as the demand grows exceed certain percentage, you know, by our estimates, roughly 2.8%, um, all the ambitious effort so far on renewables are still not sufficient to meet that demand growth. So as long as you have demand growth faster than 3% a year in electricity, you see there'll be increasing use of thermal plant, um, you know, mostly coal. So there is a balance you have to, you know, to understand the nuance. Um, clearly that um, more action are necessary to both bring the air pollution issue under control as well as the uh, coal use and emissions on carbon. Great, thank you. We have a, a related question that kind of follows up on some of the points you started to touch on, which is um, the, the questioner asked, what's the most influ influential driver in shifting the investment decisions from coal, uh, which they were characterizing as low cost, to clean sources of energy, uh, high cost? So is it social, environmental, global targets? Um, you know, what, what's driving the, the action? Is it, or is it a mix of those, perhaps? This is a, a very good question, but also a complicated question. It's determined by many <laughs> factors. There's no <laughs> one driving factor uh, affecting those investment decisions. Uh, for one, China now is a very mixed economy. There's a, lot, a very large state sector, but also equally large private sectors. So decisions made by investors are both by state actors as well as private investors. So I would say that local economic development concerns are probably one of the key determinant factors in driving those investments. And uh, uh, the concern for tax revenues, employment, uh, the typical local economic development concern are still largely, uh, you know, very dominant in the decision maker's mind. And even though China has a so-called one party system, but the decision making actually much more uh, diffused than people um, uh, have typically given China credit for. Right? So it's, it's a very nuanced situation. Yeah, I think. And there, can you add? Yes, and I think the situation is uh, nuanced indeed. Um, and the economy is definitely a really important strong force for doing that. You know, in the past few years, we you know the general sense of the government is like the traditional mode of development, you know, driving through you know, heavy infrastructure investment on steel, cement, and, you know, chemical production, that was used to be the one, the few chance economy. And in many regions of China that realized that this is no longer the case, you know, so therefore they actually tried something new, you know, China's uh, service sector exceeding 50% of GDP first time in, I believe in 2012. Um, China's 35 year plan has raised the target to increase that percentage further 
uh, and China's been doing it pretty well so far to hitting the target. Uh, even for the so-called uh, strategic emerging industries, you know, within the industrial sector, that you know, the sector that actually is more high tech, um, you know, therefore is more well at, you know, you, you get more profit out of per unit of energy input. Uh, actually, it's growing. Um, it's actually already account for 12 percent of the industrial sector as a whole. Um, so the government has really, um, it's the government's industrial policy, right? It's a very concerted effort trying to go the certain sector of the economy um, that can be service sector or could be still uh, you know, industrial sector, but more in the high tech end. Therefore, it's, you know, less in, you know, it's less likely to, to result in a very heavy emission reduction. I think that they realize that there's synergies between the economy uh, side of the equation as well as the environment and health impact of the equation. Right. And can you speak to, I mean, obviously, I know it's hard to, to generalize uh, about the population of, of such a large country, but to what, what sort of the, the feeling towards energy or climate action among the, the kind of general public in China do, what do, what do people think about the need for China to act on this or, or not? Well, I think the public is very concerned about the broader environmental energy issues. So air pollution clearly is central um, to many people's concerns. You hear it every day, people talk about it. You hear it covered in the newspapers and, and also social media. So reducing air pollution is probably the overdriving environmental uh, drivers or factors affecting many decision making in economic development as well as energy investment. So for example, there is a, a, a huge uh, move away from the coal in heating you know, people trying to find an alternative way of heating their house or their buildings shifting away from coal or they're using natural gas even electricity is largely dri you know driven by concern for air pollution uh, so there are many things I would say that uh, air quality right now is probably the number one environmental and energy issue thank you we had a couple of questions uh, around energy efficiency. So uh, can, can you speak to the role that energy efficiency and conservation might have? Does the government have any policies or targets uh, for how energy efficiency um, fits into the mix, or are there other efforts that, that you can speak to? I think uh, Ren Ping, uh, in his uh, uh, opening remarks, already talked about quite a few of the energy efficiency target, right? So China actually has uh, been a great uh, leader in the world promoting energy efficiency of its economy. For the last 15 years, it has set a hard target for so-called energy intensity improvement target, which require uh, energy use for dollar GDP to be reduced uh, by a certain percentage point. And I think the current uh, five-year plan um, between 2016 uh, to 2020 I think that's a 16% reduction, right? Um, so they have done so in the past as well. That has resulted in huge amount of energy savings. As you, know, you can imagine, China's number two uh, economy in the world to reducing, um, to improve its energy efficiency in the economy means a tremendous amount of energy savings. More specifically, there are many um, specific sectoral energy efficiency policies. We know, whilst the common one is applied to uh, very common household appliances, right? Refrigerators, air conditioners, and you know, washing machines. China has a whole host of uh, uh, energy efficiency standards as well as a labeling program. So asking um, every few years, the manufacturer has a raised standard on those uh, particular appliances. And one of the uh, very you know, unique policies that China has been utilized and been pretty successful is so-called energy saving target disaggregation mechanism. So you know, the government set a national target, and then they will disaggregate that number to specific provinces and cities. And you know, in certain level of government, they also you know, disaggregate that number to specific industries or specific enterprises specific, you know, individual enterprises. So, you know, once that target was there, that, you know, there's all set of, you know, uh, accounting mechanisms, you know, to hold them accountable. Um, they actually have to reduce that energy intensity. 
um, you know, there's also if the uh, enterprises has reached certain um, you know, any saving target, then they can propose projects and they can they can get rewarded uh, financially. If, um, there's all kind of uh, you know um, uh, schemes to provide financial uh, you know support to projects that will save energy. Um, you know, there's financial rewarding, there's regulation hard core targets. You know, that you're going to be held accountable, especially for government and for state-owned enterprises. There's also information uh, guidance, you know, just to promote information, understanding about what it takes to save energy from the industrial side. Um, that, that policy has been proven uh, one of the key uh, driver for energy efficiency uh, you know, saving in China. And, this, you know, China actually has this, um, uh, you know, Dr. Lin talked about the, the 35 year target, but that target is, is actually, you know, from 11 5 year plan that was already there. Uh, that is a, you know, um, you know, in the last few years, or five, you know, 15 years, that there have been this kind of targets and the mechanism have been mature over time. Uh, the more and more details and the enforcement is more stringent. Uh, you know, many provinces and many cities have, uh, you know, specific uh, designated agency to monitor the energy consumption for enterprises and they have responsible to actually inspect this, this uh, enterprise to actually meet the targets and if not, then provide training and, you know, or, you know, impose uh, penalties. Um, you know, if you have to um, construct a new energy intensive uh, facility, it's still possible, but you have to meet the latest standard, which is, you know, demanded to be very uh, energy efficient. So, you know, just just the key, uh, the, the, the biggest energy industry policy that I can think of, I'll just give you a taste of it. Well, thank you. That's really interesting. I want to just add to that. This is really related to uh, Canadian and China collaboration, right? I think Canadians should be proud of the Montreal Protocol work, which regulates the ozone depleting gases. Um, in phasing out those gases, um, China has participated in both the initial uh, Montreal Protocol uh, phase out of CFCs and the current phase out of HFCs as a part of a Kigali amendment to Montreal Protocol. And as the process, as part of the phasing out those F gases, uh, we're also trying to convince Chinese manufacturers to upgrade uh, the efficiency of the air conditioning that it produces. And this actually turned out to be a very major uh, climate uh, action. By uh, our research shows, by phasing out um, uh, the energy, of, uh, increasing the energy efficiency requirement for air conditioners, you can achieve the equivalent amount of uh, CO2 reduction as phasing out um, the F gases. So together, this has a huge impact globally. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Uh, we have some transport questions coming in. Um, with so many Chinese moving into the middle class and wanting to own cars, can you speak to how China is planning to deal with transportation emissions, both the existing fleet and new fleet? I know you mentioned that China is, of course, the largest producer of electric vehicles. Um, you know, if you can speak to both the, the light duty vehicles and also the heavy transport. Whoever wants to, to start. Right. So this is obviously a very complex question. It's a good question as well. Uh, so I think there's several ways China are thinking of dealing with this, right? So people are start recognizing the, the, the increasing level of affluence and the desire to own private cars. And you have seen that number of ownership uh, increasing rapidly. China is now actually the largest automobile market in the world as well. Uh, that consequently bring other associated problems associated with ownership of private cars, chiefly congestion and air pollution. So there are many ways that people are exploring how to address those questions. In particular, in the urban environment. So, um, prior um, uh, last few years, I was actually at a foundation in China that we we really started to explore how changing urban layout can help solve the transportation challenge, right? By developing more compact and and transit oriented development in, uh, in urban in, in environment, you can actually tr reduce the demand for uh, trips borne by cars or buses, right? So by promoting public transit uh, network in China, you can increasingly increasing the share of the trips taken by those trips. And also by redesigning the community uh, in, uh, in neighborhoods to allow a better environment for pedestrians or bicyclists, 
uh, so that you don't have to depend on on automobiles or motorized vehicle for any transportation. Right? China used to be called a kingdom of bicyclists, right? I think we have a great ambition that they come back again as another uh, uh, a way of dealing with the fundamental problem of automobiles and transportation. Uh, the second uh, uh, kind of uh, issue people are dealing with is looking at both increasing the efficiency uh, of vehicles as well as electrify the vehicles. So China, as with any other countries, uh, has adopted early on a regulation demanding uh, essentially a cafe type requirement that all the cars produced had to meet some minimum um, mileage requirement. In fact, China is actually fairly uh, aggressive in that setting that standard. Uh, the third element is really about EVs, right? And I mentioned earlier, China is already the largest EV market in China. People are looking to build out uh, a more complete ecosystem, including charging infrastructure to support the EV deployment. Because in uh, most Chinese cities, people live in high-rise buildings. The, the home charging is not as convenient as in Canada or the United States when you have private homes. So building a public charging network become an essential element. So you need enable electric vehicle um, to be a viable solution as well. One that people um, don't talk about is actually railroad development in China, China, which is a much more efficient way of transporting both people and cargoes. Uh, in fact, uh, energy consumption related to cargo is actually larger than that, uh, than that mm -hmm. of uh, passengers. So in the last decade or so, China has made a major push in rolling out high-speed railway across uh, China. So nowadays, all the major cities are connected by um, so the TGV type of you know super fast trains connecting major cities. And that's also shifting to a more sustainable way of transport as well. Um, but however, that the vehicle ownership is still a major concern not only for uh, carbon pollution but also for conventional pollution as well. It's a major contributor to air pollution in cities. So people are very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially under the context that, you know, if you look at the more major developed countries that, you know, transport related emissions usually, energy consumption usually account for about one third of the emissions of energy consumption. Um, and in China, that was by, you know, especially lo lower than that percentage wise. Um, therefore, you know, the general trend that we're trying to find out, they say, you know, trying to reduce the percentage that we eventually reach out. But um, guesses are that we, the, the percentage rise will continue to rise for a while. Um, you know, Dr. Lin talked about all these very important measures China has been uh, issue, uh, you know, developing um, to to trying to curb that uh, demand. But uh, I think that nevertheless, that the, the general trend is China's emissions, uh, energy, uh, ground gas emissions will shift over time. That from industry emissions to transport uh, related emissions. Um, and if if China did well, that hopefully. Uh, then we will see a much lower, uh, you know, absolute amount um, over time. So, I mean, with the potential rise of, of EVs and the the growth of um, non non car transport, as we were speaking about the the, tra uh, the train system, the rail system, can you speak to what future forecasts uh, for oil and and natural gas in China could look like? I mean, obviously that's um, you know, always a, a pretty relevant question is can, in Canada as we think about China as a, a very big potential market for uh, natural resources that are extracted here. Um, what What's your view on, on kind of how that could, could look going forward in, in China's demand? So currently, oil is about 20% the energy supply in China and natural gas is about 6%. Uh, clearly, the share of natural gas will increase uh, quite a bit in the next, you know, in, in the near to medium terms, right? The government projection shows roughly rising up to 15% um, in the near future. So that's, there's tremendous demand for natural gas um, in China. Um, as we talk about air pollution as a you know, driving force in many environmental energy policies and you know, switching away um, 
from coal to natural gas is the obvious solution, at least for the intermediate terms. Uh, so that trend is very, very positive. There's many um, project, you know, both in terms um, pipeline project as well as LNG terminals that's been developed in China. And uh, so that market is, you know, is going pretty healthy. Uh, one um, challenge has been that the transportation costs of bringing LNG to China is significant, which really raised the cost of natural gas in China. It's much, much higher. It's three or four times higher than in the U.S. and Canada. And also, as we all know, that natural gas price in China is heavily regulated, although that is some some sign of deregulation, but still there's a very uh, tight control about pricing. The government wants to make sure that, the, uh, you know, wherever that was there, it is to be cheap. So that actually, you know, you know, that for some reason, but, and because of that, actually, the supply was not as, as much as high uh, that, you know, if it's a deregulated market would have been. And also, uh, I believe this uh, BP also conducted an analysis about China's natural gas uh, projection. That um, you know they created four scenarios. Uh, the one is like the scenario in the past, you know, before the, the big pivot period. The second is the scenario of now, you know, the current policy that we all see those trends that we talk about. And there's another two uh, scenarios that much more ambitious climate actions. That that's that's what they we talk about the two degree, um, you know, global climate goal. So obviously that the current policy scenario uh, have in, uh, increased their, uh, the share of, of natural gas in, in both in British and absolute amount that are locked uh, compared to the, you know, before the big period, just because that it shifted a lot the energy consumption from coal to natural gas, which is to some more um, more environment friendly if it was treated right, right? You know, if there's no significant leakage, which is sometimes will be a problem if it's transport long distance. Um, but in the other two scenarios, the more ambitious scenarios, um, that in both those more ambitious scenarios, China's energy, uh, energy gas uh, emission over the more medium or long term uh, actually is, is lower than, than the old scenario, you know, under the, 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 the co-dominant scenarios. Uh, just because that, um, you know, natural gas actually is still a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if we take into account the net, the life cycle emissions, you know, or the leakage from the extraction, transportation, and the storage, uh, it may not be necessarily a cleaner fuel. It depends. It really depends on the management and uh, and storage and transportation on on all the all the you know along the value chain. So um, there's a lot of uncertainty there, and there's also risks that when the Chinese building is current market, uh, notably the current price will not discourage natural gas. Um, but when it's so high enough, then there's, a, there's, a, there's also some uncertainty and some risks for uh, stranded assets for natural gas. So we, if you build something new here and then you expect it to be running for 20 or 30 years, that it may run out of economic uh, you know, equation just by 10 or 15 years. It's, it's that there's some, some, some level of uncertainty there. Okay. okay, there's so many great questions, it's, it's hard to get to them all, but um, to take us back into the power sector for a little bit, um, I'll, I'll try to combine two into one. We had a couple of questions around um, the types of natural gas uh, generation that, that we'll see, so to what extent is cogeneration um, going to be important part of the mix, and to what extent will natural gas plants be uh, built new versus seeing conversion uh, from coal to natural gas, as we see, for example, uh, to some extent in, in Canada starting. Um, and then also within the uh, power sector, um, if there's anything uh, that can be said about government plans to deal with the uh, curtailments of renewables that, uh, that you spoke to in the introduction. Um, so I would say that um, for now, I don't uh, I think the majority of natural, new natural gas will, will not go to power plants um, just because it's too valuable and trying to have too few uh, natural gas. So it mostly go to industrial use or you know, residential heating. Uh, cogeneration may be some options, um, but I'm not entirely sure there. Um, as for coal to gas, I think that actually is pretty not a good idea per se, just because that, yes, it re reduces the emission uh, both greenhouse gas and um, and pollutions at when you use the natural gas, 
But if you look at the life cycle of of the uh, you know from from converting the coal to natural gas, and if you look at the water consumption and all the uh, all the conventional pollutants as well as greenhouse gas emissions, it's actually not a good deal. Um, it's actually very costly. Um, it can easily uh, be beat by you know just natural gas uh, from from oil and gas well. So uh, it's very risky investment. There are some investments. Act uh, notingly, uh, you know, that's actually China is doing some of the some of the projects uh, coal to gas, but uh, it has not been proven as a profitable model. You know, there's still some companies trying to do that, um, and you know, and the problem is that China's coal mine is if China is going to do that, they're going to use China's coal to do natural gas rather than uh, you know a way to use China's coal resources. But the coal mines, a large extent, that was overlapping with the uh, regions that have a have limited water resources availability, and you know, coal to gas is a is a is a process that uses a lot of water and has a lot of water pollution uh, risk. So, um, so there's a lot of you know reasons that may not be a good idea to uh, to you know have large scale coal to gas manufacturing uh, in China's context. Um, as far as curtailment uh, uh, measures, actually, there's uh, multiple major Chinese is uh, approaching is doing. You know, one is to just to halt the new construction of coal power plants. You know, some of them actually already under construction. China's already ordered them to um, to delay the, the completion of those constructions. Uh, therefore, just by uh, by reducing the competition from coal power plants, um, and China's actually you know closing them. Uh, you know, smaller and you know inefficient coal power plants uh, to reduce the uh, to reduce the competition from uh, from renewable energy curtailments. Um, there's also other uh, mechanisms that you know um, China, uh, for example, China has set a non-hydro renewable energy target, national target, as nine percent. So it means that by 2020, China aims to have nine percent of the electricity consumption coming from non-hydro uh, non-hydro renewable sources. And then China also has this aggregate that target to provinces now. Um, what remains to be seen is uh, whether China will be actually uh, you know enforce this target. As the, to the same extent that it enforces the energy saving target, if it, it does that, then you know it actually if if, if each province has the quota to meet certain percentage of you know power supply from non hydro renewable energy, then um, it's a uh, being, you're being held accountable to doing that. Then actually I believe that will uh, that will provide a lot of pressure for the grid, uh, which is you know have to be you know maintain a very good relationship to the to the regional government. Um, to 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 encourage renewable energy uh, supply and generation, and there's also this uh, green power certificate, uh, which can be uh, you know trading scheme. Now it's a voluntary trading; it's not not tied to the uh, national non non hydro renewable energy target now. But if those two are instruments tied together, then you know it will provide a lot of financial uh, incentives for a renewable energy project to you know to generate electricity. Uh, because they can sell the the quota, you know, um, to other provinces or other 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 power companies that cannot meet those quota. So it actually provide it also uh, you know help to mitigate the, the financial issue, the budgetary issue for subsidies. So um, that uh, that green power certificate market is already um, well, the voluntary trading already begin. Uh, it's not yet tied to the the target yet, but once it's tied, then I believe there's a lot of potential. So, Sarah, I think you're you were asking the, about the prospect of uh, changing coal power plant to natural gas power plant, right? Yeah. So, yeah, to on the extent. fundamental economics, it simply would not work in China. That would be very costly for uh, switching to natural gas uh, from coal plant. So, if you are running a competitive power market, uh, those natural gas plant probably will not work. However, there's a definitely a need for fast reacting or ramping plant. Natural gas could be very good, you know, pickers or providing other ancillary services. So that's you know that's but it's not it's baseline a base load power plant. Uh, in terms of the curtailment and renewables, I think there's a variety of reasons uh, they're the way they are today. And they're much higher than international norm. I think ramping mentioned. Some of the strategy the Chinese government uh, has adopted to deal with the curtailment renewables. Um, uh, in, in particular, China has its national target 
to increase its non-fossil uh, um, power generation source to a certain percentage. So at some point, I think they have to start enforcing that requirement. So that provides a strong um, incentive to reduce curtailment. Uh, however, one of the fundamental um, barrier to integration renewable is actually uh, lack of a power market in China. There's a tremendous of um, trade barriers, even internally, right? So the, the provincial protectionism is actually one of the fun fundamental reason uh, renewable for one part of China are not being used in another part. So by breaking down those local trade barriers to allow, for example, uh, Beijing to use more power from Inner Mongolia or wind, or for Xinjiang to send more other, you know, Qinghai of solar wind to other parts of China, would actually, to a large extent, solve those renewable integration problem. Right now, the power market, as well, right now, the, the power sector uh, under something called equal share dispatch rule, essentially all generators, particular thermal generators, getting equal number of hours for generation, which is clearly not economical uh, decision making, not rational, but also it's not environmentally rational. There are a lot more cleaner uh, sources, both hydro, wind and solar can be dispatched if you run actually economic dispatch. So that's one of the fundamental changes and that's need to happen. China is already making uh, progress toward the direction. So now there's different provincial, different provinces are experimenting with setting up their own power market. So that's something that I think that will definitely help to facilitate a greater adoption and integration renewables. Interesting, so you're saying that without actually construction of any new uh, generation assets, but simply by changing the market rules and the collaboration, it's already right. possible to yeah. actually reduce emissions. Exactly. Yeah. Although we're not unfamiliar with the, the challenges of, of working between different provinces in Canada as well, too. So another thing we share in common, I think. <laughs> in fact, some of the issues related to transmission line siding, transmission cost allocation are very similar to what we see in North America. Interesting. Well, I think everybody has a lot that they uh, can learn uh, from each other. Um, just to kind of bring us back up to the big picture for, for our last time here, uh, there was one kind of general question um, that I'll pose to both of you uh, around if you can speak to, uh, you know, what is China's involvement and influence in energy in other parts of the world? Uh, there was one specific question around China's role of public finance in coal power, and if you think that that, that might be shifting at all um, in terms of the uh, role of the, the banks uh, and financing coal projects abroad. Um, but, you know, more generally as well, kind of how you can see the influence of China uh, playing out. Well, that's a great question. I think as China's role as a, as a you know, investor in, in all kinds of assets in, abroad, that become a, a much bigger question to ask. I think people are really concerned about potentially the carbon footprint of China's overseas investment. That's something I think we both need to work with China as well as recipient countries, right? Uh, working on either aspect alone is probably not sufficient. Uh, China clearly is making the right directional signals, right? It is, in its Belt and, and the Road Initiative, China has made a clear a signal to grain, graining its investment in Belt Road Initiative, uh, in one of its premier new development financing institution, uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, made also a priority to set a tighter environmental safeguard for its investment. And how those principles and guidelines will be implemented in actual project is something worth watching. And, uh, and we all need to work with China, as well as the country that receiving those investments uh, to set a tighter environmental uh, safeguard. In some ways, I do see that there is actually economic rationale for China to invest in green technologies. Uh, for example, um, you know, you could invest in solar instead of invest coal power plants. In many ways, uh, investing solar might give China a better return than investing in coal plants um, because you capture a much bigger part of the value chain. Um, you actually support supporting um, much higher value added products and services coming from China. 
Um, but those are still our hopes. I think we need to work pretty hard on that issue to make sure those uh, principles and, and guidelines are implemented in actual practice. Yeah, indeed, that's uh, you know that is very really nuanced uh, you know uh, issue. So for on one end, that you know China actually because China has really advanced coal uh, consumption technology for coal power plants. You know the the coal power plants China built in the last few years is actually the most advanced and most carbon uh, you know energy efficiency one. So there's a tendency for China for some part of the industries to export the technology to uh, to countries that actually want the technology and you know. Since we already have the technology, it's nature for you to to sell it, right? On the other end, uh, China also a big player in renewable energy, so that kind of like you know weight on the other other end of the equation because China is also a big player in renewable energy, um, you know, investment technology. So um, so end of end of day is like you know which which part of the industry wins out, and um, and the, where the government have play more. Uh, deliberate, uh, you know, guidance and to shift it that, that, that investment to one rather than the other. Um, just a, f a couple of figures that you know, in 2016, China's increased its uh, foreign investment in renewables uh, by 60%. Um, so, international uh, foreign investment has actually reached a record, 32 billion. Um, that was according to a report that from in the Institute for Energy Economy and Financial Analysis, right? Um, now, the another uh, data point is that China's, uh, you know, the, the, not China's, the, but the regional bank, the, the, the new development bank, uh, makes its first loans, and and it's it's about renewable energy. I think that is a really good sign that at least uh, there's a conscious effort for China to, you know, to increase renewable energy as part of it. Um, that's a that's a, this is an ongoing discussion and debate uh, within different uh, part of the industry as well as, um, and hopefully that this will work out well. Great. Well, I think we have time for one final question. Uh, so looking to the future, um, can you comment on kind of China's uh, likelihood to meet its 2030 targets? And then thinking into the second half of the century where we need to think about uh, reaching the zero carbon um, kind of metric as, as globally, is that something that uh, this decarbonization is already, to what extent is that already being talked about in, in China among energy and climate experts? And, and to what extent do you think that's possible for China to get there? As I mentioned before, China has made its commitment in Paris to peak its emission by 2030 and earlier if possible, right? So, so China is making an effort to peak, first of all, but also try to peak as early as it can. Uh, there are many scholars and government officials been talking about how they can accelerate that transition. Our own research uh, in collaboration with our Chinese partner has shown China clearly can probably peak this emission earlier in 2030, maybe around 2025, and some people say even earlier. So that discussion is ongoing, and people are actively looking forward to specific ways of accelerating the pace of transition to a uh, low carbon uh, future. So I think that, that, uh, that that's a very healthy dialogue right now. I think if anything, that engaging with Canada and the other international uh, community on a global, a global compact, how do we all do this together, not depending on one single country to do it all, is an important aspect that we can support a faster transition to low carbon future in China. Just to provide a bit more data to support Dr. Lin's point that you know, China is on track to, you know, to, to, to hit its Paris Agreement target. Um, talking about the um, carbon intensity targets, right? China has actually committed to uh, reduce its carbon intensity by 20, 60 to 65 percent by 2030, and then by 40 to 45 percent by 2020. Um, our based on the latest uh, statistics and you know based on our calculation, China's already reached the upper end of its 2020 target um, in the first three quarters this year. Um, so it means that you know China already reduced 40 percent of its carbon intensity by uh, compared to 2005 in by the end by the first three quarter. Of 2017. That was upper end of the 2020 target. So, you know, if you are you are ahead of your 2020 targets, and then you know that by all means that it, you have really good style and really good uh, on track to, to hit your 2030 target. Uh, um, you know that is one one piece. And the other piece is non fossil fuel uh, percentage of total energy consumption. Um, by that, the China's target uh, by 2020 is a 50 percent 
and then by 2030 is about um, 20%. So the latest data indicated that by the first three quarters of 2007, that number already is about 14.3%. Uh, so it's very unlikely that China will hit that target uh, by, the, by sometime next year or even later this year, uh, probably sometime next year. Um, that means China is two years ahead of schedule again in an unfossil fuel energy target. Um, it puts China in a really good position to run up its uh, reduction target, you know, particularly in this carbon intensity target as well as the um, non-fossil energy target. Um, these two targets are, I think, is a little bit easier than the um, than the carbon picking targets to be improved because just because the government has very really good track record in the past to um, you know beating this target and um, you know therefore you know that is actually one way to improve think about further improvement because the Paris Agreement actually called countries to update and potentially enhance their ambition level by 2020. Um, so this is the thing that China can think about and they are in good position to do so. Uh, another area is that the non-CO2 greenhouse gases. Uh, you know, China's current target does not include, international commitment does not include non-CO2. Uh, it's mostly carbon intensity target uh, or, you know, picking carbon emissions. But, you know, China's in good position to to limit its, you know, uh, non-CO2 greenhouse gases or S gases that Dr. Lee talked about, as well as mass impact uh, leakage from energy sector, uh, as well as, you know, uh, nitro dioxide, uh, oxide, nit nitro oxide from, from, you know, agricultural fuel land. So uh, that's another area that China can do a lot, and that's not, a, well, that's a small percent in terms of total emissions, but because China's uh, scale of economy, that actually is quite substantial in absolute amount. Great. Well, I think we've reached the end of our webinar. We have enough questions to, I think, have a whole other one. So apologies to, to those who didn't uh, get their questions answered, but thank you, for, uh, thank you for submitting them. I'd like to thank both speakers again very much for sharing their expertise with, with us today. Um, we'll be posting the video recording at Pemina.org, where you can also find uh, updates and more information there. Um, if you have questions that didn't get answered, I also encourage you to check out WRI's website at WRI.org. Um, or their China-focused ChinaFAQs.org, where you can find some China-specific answers, as well as the China Energy Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as well. So thank you again very much to uh, both of our speakers, and, and thanks to everybody who joined us today to listen. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be part of it. Thanks. Bye. Okay.